Hello and welcome. My name is Béline Ferzon. I'm the King Center uh, Senior Event Planner. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today. As you may know, the King Center is a multidisciplinary research center working to address poverty and inequity in low and middle income countries. We offer opportunities for undergraduates to get involved with research on a wide range of topics that address global development issues, as well as funding for independent research. We are also excited to be able to present events such as this one. Thank you for joining us today. Um, don't forget to stick around after the talk for informal conversation and connections as well. It's my honor uh, to introduce uh, Professor Jennifer Pan today a political scientist whose research focuses on political communication, digital media, and authoritarian politics. She's also the Sir Robert Ho Tong Professor of Chinese Studies, Professor of Communication, and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spoley Institute. As you may see from her bio, it would take me far too long to do justice to her accomplishments, so I'm confident that you'd rather hear directly from her on her research and the role of digital media in authoritarian democratic politics. Thank you, Professor Pan, from, for joining us today. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. The motivation for the talk is um, given the rise of digital technologies and how much easier it is for information to flow, we know that governments all around the world are imposing limits to this transnational flow of information. And as a researcher, what I'm interested in is what are the consequences um, of those barriers to information transmission. Countries all over the world are using strategies from uh, internet filtering to regulations in order to stop the transmission of information. And I think nowhere is the effort to control transnational flows of information as sustained and sophisticated as they are in China. Um, I think most of you will be familiar with the great, so-called Great Firewall, which is a whole set of different technical strategies and government regulations that make it difficult for people who are located geographically in China to access information that's easy to access elsewhere, as well as limits the outflow of information from the country. But despite how well, uh, how familiar we might be with the Great Firewall, we really don't have good empirical data about how much information flows from the global information ecosystem into China and how does it flow in, as well as how much information flows out from China and what are the mechanisms through which information outflow occurs. Okay, so that's kind of those two questions are what is going to orient today's talk. And the empirics are based on a set of papers, including papers that are published as well as working papers. So you get to see work in progress here. Um, starting with the question of how much information flows into China from the global information ecosystem and that, those mechanisms, um, we're going to look at information that captures global public attention and then see whether that, those topics make their way into public discussions in China. Okay, so what do we mean by global public attention? We're going to proxy that with viral tweets. And making their way into public discussions in China, we're going to proxy that with Weibo discussions. So obviously, these are both imperfect proxies. Um, and I'll, in the next kind of in the paper I'll talk about next, we'll try to build on this. But for the purpose of this paper, we're looking at viral tweets, specifically uh, discussions as COVID-19 emerged. In January to April of 2020, we look at an English language corpus of tweets. We look at ones related to China, and then we look at those that got the most retweets per week. So we narrow pretty narrow in really on the tweets that got the most attention during this period when China was very salient in the world, and China was very much aware of its positioning. And then public discussions on Weibo, we have a corpus um, of Weibo posts from the time period, and we hone in on those that are COVID related. So 6.7 million COVID posts from January to April of 2020. Um, and our goal, first goal, is to just understand whether English viral tweets co-occur in Chinese on Weibo. And so the challenge is that this is a multilingual English to Chinese um, comparison. We're looking at two different social media platforms. Even though Twitter and Weibo are probably the most similar, there's differences uh, across them. And then we're doing N by M matching. So N, we've already narrowed down to these highly retweeted tweets, but M is still very large. And so 
you know, it becomes computationally intensive. And so what we do is develop, um, use various deep learning models to retrieve posts from Weibo that are the highest likelihood matches and then use human verification to decide whether there is a match. And so there are these steps of retrieval, ranking, and then human annotation. And I'm happy to get into the details of that um, if anyone is interested in the Q&A. Um, so what do we find? Uh, so this figure is not meant for you to be able to read any of the actual text. The x-axis is the time period, and the y-axis is the log scale retweet counts. So these are the viral tweets that we focus on. There's 68 out of 150 that co-occur on Weibo. And among those, 32 represent inflows of information. So information that did not originate in China, but originated outside of China's borders and made their way inside. So you can think about a quarter of these global conversations that got attention everywhere in the English-speaking world pertaining to COVID-19 and China made their way into China. And given that we're looking at China and COVID, this is likely a ceiling, we think. If we think about, if we look at what types of information were more or less likely to make their way into China, we see that misinformation is not more likely to get into the country. So about 4% of those viral tweets contain some type of misinformation, and then 6% of the inflow contains some type of information. Um, but what is a little bit different in terms of the content is that content antagonistic toward China, so this could be toward the Chinese government, toward Chinese people, toward Chinese policies, disproportionately are more likely to make their way into China. Um, and remember, all of these tweets are about China. So, so it's not the about China part, it's really the antagonism part. So about a third of those viral tweets were antagonistic toward China in some way, but of the inflow, two thirds are antagonistic toward China. Okay. Um, when we then turn to how is this information making their way into China, we think about there might be four different types of actors. Uh, state media and Chinese government, uh, commercialized media, Weibo users, and then foreign entities. So given China's strong control over its information ecosystem, we might expect the state media and government to totally dominate information transmission into the country. But that's, actually, we don't see that that's the case. We see a role for all four of these types of uh, mechanisms of transmission. But let me give you an example of how information makes it their, its way in, because it's often less direct than you might expect, and lots of different players are involved in information transmission. Okay. This is an example of state media and government transmitting information in. So on February 3rd, 20, uh, 2020, the Wall Street Journal had an opinion article that was titled, China is the real sick man of Asia. I know some of you might remember this. There was a lot of um, uproar and controversy. Uh, a few, uh, two weeks later, about two weeks later, uh, Chinese media, CGTN, People's Daily, post on Weibo that Wall Street Journal reporters have been expelled from China. So this is not the information inflow. This is things happening in China. But a few hours after this announcement of Wall Street Journal uh, reporter expulsion, Secretary of State Pompeo, at the, uh, uh, at the time Pompeo, condemns the expulsion on Twitter. And so that is the information that then makes it, its way into China, but it does so a few days later, when Beijing Review, which is a state media outlet, reports on Pompeo's tweet uh, in a video posted to Weibo criticizing both the Wall Street Journal and the US Secretary of State. So it's this response to foreign criticism that facilitates the transmission of information in. And we actually see a lot of examples of that. So in late March, Spanish media reported that Chinese testing kits were defective. Chinese embassy in Spain refuted this allegation on Twitter. And then that's how user, uh, people in China learned about the fact that there was this claim Chinese testing kits were defective. Um, similarly, German media outlets were criticizing China's COVID response. In mid-April, Chinese embassy responds on Twitter in both German and English and Chinese, and they post all of those languages of responses on China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, which is accessible inside China. And so then Weibo users discuss, and that's how this information about the fact that German media is criticizing China's COVID response makes its way into China. And 10 out of the 32 instances that we can identify inflow um, are facilitated through state media. So this is the largest proportion, but it's not everything. Um, commercialized media also plays a role. So all, all media in China has some state and government affiliation, but we consider something 
commercialized media if the entity to which the media outlet is registered is not directly a government or party apparatus. Okay, so something like NetEase News would be considered by us commercialized media. Um, when WHO convened to declare COVID-19 a global emergency, NetEase News reported on it immediately and Weibo users began to share this information. It was actually one day later that this announcement trends on Twitter. So this is important because it went viral on Weibo before it went viral on Twitter because of the time difference. And so we're just using, this is important because we're just using Twitter viral tweets as a proxy for information that appears outside of China making their way into China. Okay, so the timing doesn't necessarily correspond with inflow. Okay, this is another example of commercialized media transmitting information in. So on April 22nd of 2020, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, criticizes the Chinese government for delaying COVID-19 report to WHO. Then Guan Cha, uh, Guan Cha Zhou Wang criticizes Pompeo's remarks, posts that on Weibo, and, and then uh, we see discussions on Weibo of Pompeo. And it wasn't until one day later that Pompeo actually tweets his statement because the initial video was on, um, I think it was on C-SPAN. Uh, so again, this is where there was discussions on Weibo before there were discussions on Twitter, but again, it's the inflow of information. Uh, this is seven out of 32. Then we see some instances where Weibo users with no uh, discernible government or media affiliation are transmitting information into the country and there's no traditional media reporting on it. So you can read these tweets. Um, and we see um, Weibo users who are geolocated outside of China posting information from the uncensored internet into China. Uh, and they're drawing content from uh, different media outlets which are not accessible inside of China. Um, this, is a, this is another example, I think, which shows how convoluted the global information ecosystem is. So on April 3rd, you have an editor of an Indian media site who tweets a video snippet from an Urdu TV channel that there are these Chinese underwear masks being sent to Pakistan. Okay, so this is a tweet where showing a snippet of a television broadcast. Um, uh, two days later, the Indian mainstream, uh, new, Mainstream Indian newspaper, the Business Standard, reports on the same issue. Then you have this extremely anti-Chinese uh, Communist Party outlet, New Tang Dynasty Television, which reports on this, citing both the initial tweet and the Indian um, Business Standard article. And then a few hours later, you have a regular Weibo user who somehow sees this New Tang Dynasty Television article and says whether this is fake news. And that is the way in which this initial reporting makes its way into China. So here you have traditional media outlets, you have social media, you have media professionals, you have non-professionals, and it's the interplay between them that allows information to get into China. So 12 out of the 32 incidents come from ordinary Weibo users. And then finally, there are some, uh, a few instances where foreign entities here, Russian Embassy, MIT Technology Review, uh, SBS television channel from Australia, who are reporting information and bringing information into China. Okay, so what are the implications of this? One is that uh, there is relatively limited inflow of information from at least Twitter to China. But interestingly, the Chinese government is not the sole gatekeeper of information transmission, which we might have expected given the government's control. Um, and then it's this interesting um, characteristic that content that's antagonistic to China is more likely to flow in. And the antagonistic content is not only transmitted through the kind of government and state media channels, it's across all mechanisms. In all mechanisms, antagonistic information is more likely to flow into China. Okay, but as I mentioned before, the problem with this paper is that maybe COVID is a special case. It's too crucial, too salient uh, to China, um, and China was too salient to the world at this time, and we're just using Twitter data, so that's just one platform. So then um, we turn to analysis of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, this is something that captured global attention, but it's not central to China. Fundamentally, it's not about China. Um, so how did information about this conflict flow into China? And what narratives about the war dominated Chinese social media um, when it came to the Russo-Ukraine war? And so here we gathered half a million posts related to the war from Weibo, posted 
at, again, the onset of the conflict, so February to April of 2022. Um, we classified posts initially into two kind of meta-narratives or two meta-strategic narratives. So one is the idea that Putin is the aggressor, Putin and Russia are the aggressor in the conflict, the Zelensky Ukrainians are territorial defenders, the NATO, US, um, EU are helping preserve freedom in Ukraine, and then there's pro-Ukrainian misinformation. So I think these narratives are very familiar to those of us who are living in the US at the time. But then on the other hand, there's this what we call Putin as victim narrative. So this is the um, story about the conflict that NATO, US, and the EU are the instigator of the conflict. Uh, and Zelensky in Ukraine is a puppet of the US and NATO. Um, and Ukrainians are welcoming Russia as liberators. Putin and Russia are anti-fascists. And then there's pro-Russian misinformation, like that there are US bio labs in Ukraine. Okay. Um, what we find is that uh, after the Winter Olympics end in China, then you see the spike and increase of discussion on Weibo about the conflict, which peaks when Russian troops enter Kharkiv on February 20, 27th of 2022, and then it declines. Um, and this is, and then there's a slight bump uh, in April of mid-April. Um, but actually, this is less discussion that there are US bio labs in Ukraine and more uh, Weibo users saying that the Chinese government was talking about US bio labs in an effort to distract them from lockdowns related to COVID happening in China. Um, OK, so there's a lot of content, especially in February, related to the conflict. But the, the Putin as aggressor and Putin as victim narratives are a relatively small proportion of those discussions. Um, so most of the discussions are just Weiwa, sorry, most of the Weiwa content is just news reporting facts about the conflict. Um, in terms of the, those narratives, they're a relatively small proportion of the Weibo content. But if we look between them, the Putin as victim narrative does have, is more prevalent than the Putin as aggressor narrative on Chinese social media. Okay, so then we're interested in where did these narratives come from? Uh, and specifically, what was the influence of Chinese, Russian, Ukrainian, and American media ecosystems on those narratives? So specifically, we want to understand did Chinese media play up the Putin as victim narrative, and that's why people on social media were adopting that narrative? Or was that information coming directly from Russian or Ukrainian uh, media ecosystems? And we added the American one in there because we had the English language data, just as a comparison. OK, so we use those same half a million posts. And here, instead of using the meta narratives, we cluster um, the content into much smaller and more specific stories, um, and I'll show you an example of, of those. And I, again, I'm happy to talk about the methods, but I won't focus on them right now. Um, and then we collected 24 million news articles from 2,500 news sites in Chinese, Ukrainian, Russian, and US domains. So we're using domain registries to identify where a website is. Um, and then we're looking at, for each narrative that we find on Weibo, do we find a matching narrative in any of those languages? Um, uh, and if so, what's the timing of the emergence of those narratives? Okay. So here's um, the top 10 most frequently occurring narratives. And so these are very specific. This is not the meta narratives. The most frequent is this one that says military conflict between Russia and NATO broke out in eastern Ukraine. Uh, various sanctions imposed by the United States and Europe have the potential to completely destroy Russia. So that's the dark blue one. Um, the one right above it says uh, Russian President Putin held peace talks with Ukraine President uh, Vladimir Zelensky and the two sides expressed their views on the situation in, U in Ukraine. Um, there's obviously the peak is happening in mid to late February, but there's some, uh, this uh, biolabs thing that occurs a little bit later uh, in March, end of, uh, end of February and March. Okay, so these are examples of the narratives. Uh, what we find is that 27% of those narratives first appeared on Russian news websites, which are in orange in this um, network figure. 26% first appeared on Ukrainian news websites. Those are the ones in red. 15% first appeared on US news websites. That's in um, purple. You can see CNN most prominently. And then 10% first appeared on Chinese news websites. And the Chinese news website that appears the most is actually Sputnik, 
uh, .cn. Um, but we're considering that Chinese because the domain registration is registered in China. But obviously, it is um, Russian state sponsored. So, and the remaining 22% appears first on Weibo, but it could have appeared somewhere else first, but we're just, it didn't appear first in Russian, Ukrainian, or US media sites. Uh, so what this shows is that Russia had a, quite a big direct influence on the narratives appearing on Chinese social media, and it's not mediated through Chinese state media. Um, and when we look at the details of how Russian kind of Russian media is able to directly transmit information to Chinese social media, you see oftentimes posts on Chinese social media that are showing directly clip, clips of Russian television broadcasts of the conflict. Um, and some of our next steps is getting into the details of how that transmission is happening. Okay, um, I also want to show you this result on the stance of narratives. And what you see is that the, the narratives appearing on Chinese social media are actually generally neutral toward both Russia and Ukraine. There is more uh, pro-Russia content than pro-Ukraine content, more against Ukraine content and than against Russia content. But overwhelmingly, it's negative toward the United States. Even though it's a conflict of Russia and Ukraine, it's the, the stance of these content is negative toward the United States and positive toward China. Okay. So the implications of this is that China's information environment is actually more porous than we might expect. Like taking the perspective of us in the United States, we might see China as a very closed information ecosystem. But China's information ecosystem is not closed to everywhere in the world. And through this study, we see quite close ties between both China, um, China's media ecosystem and Russia, and also with, between China and Ukraine. OK. Um, in the last five minutes, I just want to share a little bit about outflow. So if China is limiting inflow of information from the West, is it also limiting outflow of information to the West? And here we did a study looking at expulsion of journalists. So in the first study, I talked about this expulsion of Wall Street Journal uh, reporters in uh, 2020 in China. After that expulsion, then there was a tit for tat retaliation of expelling more reporters. The uh, Trump administration expelled, set limits on um, reporters affiliated with Chinese state media, and then China expelled a bunch of reporters from New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. And so we wanted to look at the effects of these expulsions, and we're using different time series causal inference methods to try to get some leverage um, looking at ex reporting by expelled outlets and non-expelled outlets. Um, and you can think that there might be three different things happening with expulsion. One is a chilling effect. Like there's less reporting on China. There, the reporting relies on Chinese government sources. You might also expect resilience. So these outlets, especially the three that are expelled, are quite well resourced. They change how they gather information, how they write stories. Maybe they rely more on contractors and freelancers. And last, you might expect backlash. So you're already expelled. Now you have nothing to be afraid of. You can say anything about China that you want. Right? That would be backlash. What we find is that um, there's a decrease in the absolute number of reporting, but not relative volume of reporting. Um, we don't see any change or reliance on the Chinese Communist Party or Chinese government for sources. So uh, it's not, there's no greater or less reliance. And we don't see a change in the sentiment of reporting. And so it seems like this suggests there's resilience, but we wanted to push a little bit further. And we do find there's an increase in collaboration. So what that means, if you look at bylines of uh, reports by the expelled outlets, as well as um, sometimes articles at the end, they'll say XYZ contributed to the story. If you look at that and the bylines, you'll see that more people are contributing to each story after the expulsion. So this seems to be uh, suggestive of changes in news routines. Even though Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and um, Washington Post are expelled, they are using contractors, using um, uh, Chinese nationals who are still in the country to help report on stories about China. OK. But the, I think the caution here is that even though we don't see a change in the time period we analyzed, they could have a delayed effect um, as these outlets lose their connections over time to the country. Um, 
just the final thing, if you know, China hasn't successfully li limited this outflow of information, is it trying to shape global information ecosystem in other ways? And I think the answer, probably many of you are aware of this, is yes. Um, it, starting in 2013, uh, Xi Jinping has emphasized this idea of telling China's story well, and there's specific strategies associated with this to kind of these four main narratives of portraying China as a great civilization, China as a leader of the East, China as a responsible leader, and China as a socialist success. And you can look at the sub-narratives. It, this is all detailed in policy documents. It's public um, of what each of these meta-narratives means. And I, one thing that I thought was interesting is China is a socialist, it's interesting because um, none of the sub-narratives actually talk about socialism as we might think about it. It's not about redistribution. It's not about inequality. It's about being hopeful and vibrant and open to the outside. So I thought that was interesting of what socialism is concept. What is socialism under C? OK. Um, uh, so that, this strategy was first uh, kind of talked about in 2013. And then starting in 2016, um, this goal of strengthening China's international communication and public diplomacy was incorporated into the 13th five-year plan. And there was implementation that began in 2017, most notably the rebranding of CCTV International as CGTN. Um, and you can see this is daily a historical follower count on Twitter. CGTN grew very quickly in terms of the followership um, in 2018. And we don't. We did a various analysis, and this is not likely driven by bots or inauthentic accounts. You can see in the middle of 2018, there's a dip in the line of Xinhua, People's Daily, and a little bit for CGTN. That's when Twitter uh, implemented a mass culling of inauthentic and bot-driven accounts. And so you can see, if we think that Twitter was pretty good at doing that, CGTN's followership wasn't really affected by, by that mass culling. Um, we can also see that after 2017, CGTN and China Daily really increased their volume of content that they posted to Twitter. And they increased, um, and there's a substantial share of that content that's related to these uh, strategic narratives. I think another interesting thing is that CGTN, Xinhua, and China Daily really increased their coverage of countries. And this is especially kind of striking when we look at uh, Western media outlets like CNN and BBC, who over time have been decreasing their reporting, their international reporting. So just at the same time as C C CNN and BBC are decreasing their international reporting, you see RT, Al Jazeera, as well as CGTN increasing their international coverage. OK. Um, but even though they're doing a lot in terms of volume of content um, and coverage of countries, we can see that engagement, uh, this is median likes, replies, retweets per tweet per million followers still lags when we look in comparison to other Western media outlets. OK, so to sum up it, it's some of everything that I've talk, talked about, uh, if we look at inflows, inflows of information from the West into China is limited, and the government is the main gatekeeper. Inflows of information from other parts of the world are less limited or maybe not limited. Attempts to limit the outflow of information from China to the West haven't yet resulted in tangible changes, at least when we look at international media reporting. And China is competing with Western media outlets to try to shape global views of China. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. All of this work is joint with current and former PhD students and co-authors at other universities, so they're very important to this work. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, we look forward to you sticking around for some informal conversation. And uh, we just wanted to um, highlight our next event, uh, which is going to be the same kind of format uh, as today. And we'll have Felipe Munoz um, talk about the Inter-American Development ba Bank's migration program. Um, he's a fantastic speaker, very interesting person. So we encourage you to. Uh, come on February 15 for lunch with us. Thank you.